Okay. So yeah, like I said, this is week nine of the story of the Bible, the last session. So in this session, we'll attempt to cover 6,000 years of history and 1,000 years of prophecy in less than an hour. So strap yourself in. My old man tells me I, uh, I speak quickly. Um, that, that's certainly going to be the case today. So try and keep up. Uh, we'll see how we go. But like always, it is an informal presentation. If you have a question or there's an important um, aspect that I missed, please, please call it out and we can have a, have a chat, chat about it. So, week one. Gee, that was a long time ago. That was about eight weeks, nine weeks ago, funny enough. Um, but off God, creation, and the first sin. So we first looked at the Bible. What is the Bible? Um, it contains 66 books, Old and New Testament. And the Testament is uh, a covenant or a promise. Um, it was written by 40 independent authors um, over 1,600 years in 10 different countries. So, you know, it had to be uh, inspired by a, a single being, being out the almighty creator. And we looked at 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 17, saying all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we, we know God's the author of the Bible. And it's been proven throughout prophecy and archaeology uh, time and time again. It's proven itself to be very, very true. And it makes some very bold claims about itself, which we'll cover off. Um, through the golden thread of the story. We looked at God's purpose. Um, what is God's purpose? Why are we here? This is meaning of life. For the earth, his purpose is he wants the earth to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And he repeats this in other pa passages as well. That's taken from Habakkuk 2 verse 14. And so that's why God created us um, at the very beginning. Is, um, he didn't create robots that had no mind of the, their own. He created a being such as ourselves that could reflect on God's greatness and give him glory for the amazing creation and life he's given us, but the hope he's offered as well. We looked at the characteristics of God. So God is eternal. Uh, he is a lawgiver and judge. He is supreme. He is the creator and sustainer of the entire universe. Um, he is holy and he is our father. Um, and he, he has attributes of a father, and as a father, he actively seeks a relationship with us. And we pick this up time and time again in the Bible, where God is actively seeking a relationship with us. And so we'll pick that up as we go through as well. We looked at the seven days of creation, um, and so six literal days of creating, and the seventh day God rested, and they're there um, up on the screen um, in relatively logical order. Um, and then at the conclusion, um, after the sixth day, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And everything was in a, a not perfect harmony. God created uh, Adam and Eve, um, made Adam from the earth, all the dust of the ground. Um, because of Adam and Eve's later sin, um, we return to the dust when we die, don't we? We know that. That's from Genesis 3, 19. God breathed into Adam the breath of life, and so this is what gives us our, our life uh, sustenance, it, it sustains us. And the Bible clearly says what happens to animals is the same thing that happens to human beings when we die. So um, you'll, you won't find immortal soul in the Bible. Um, the Bible clearly tells us that the breath um, in us is from God and when we die, that breath returns to God. And Ecclesiastes talks about the state of death and things like that. Um, Eve was made from Adam, uh, presented by God to Adam as a companion and wife. So right at the beginning, at the very, very beginning, 6,000 years ago, God instituted uh, marriage, uh, being uh, one man and one wife. God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to take care of it, and God made some cr really clear expectations. There was the one rule, uh, they couldn't partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, and man was given free will, like I said. Unfortunately, um, and sorry, and the law was to be obeyed and there was going to be consequences for disobedience. Unfortunately, we know the story of the fall in the Garden of Eden, don't we? Where um, there was an external temptation from the snake um, and we failed that test um, and uh, we became dying or mortal creatures at the very beginning. This is from Genesis 3, verse 6. And our response to that, they realised that they were naked, was they tried to cover themselves in fig leaves. Um, that wasn't sufficient covering. So a nakedness is, is kind of like um, sin nature. And so God provided an animal skin. Now for that animal skin to be provided, bloodshed was necessary. And once again, we're going to um, pick up this theme of bloodshed being required throughout the whole story of the Bible. It's this echo or a golden thread that links 
um, uh, forward to Jesus Christ. So there was consequences, as God clearly explained there would be, um, should we fail. And so the snake was cursed, uh, the woman was cursed, increased in childbearing, and the man was cursed. So the, the lamb was actually cursed as a result of that sin. And so, yeah, we became all dying creatures, um, and death was the, the, um, all that was there at the end of that life. Romans 5 verse 12 puts it this way, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. So it puts it pretty, pretty um, black and white, doesn't it? But was this the end? Was God, as a loving father, seeking relationship? Um, was he just going to let us die and that was the end of it? Of course not. So we're introduced to Genesis 3.15, uh, which uh, says, um, I'll put enmity, so he's speaking to the snake, which represents sin nature. I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. What is that saying? There's funny language around enmity and things like that. So what it's setting up is there's, there's a conflict uh, between the seed of the woman, which is um, those that follow God and is Jesus Christ, and the serpent seed, um, which um, articulates here is the thinking of the flesh and follow the natural inclinations. So that, um, that promise that God made is actually the first promise of hope. It's the start of the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus Christ. Um, and so it's saying that um, sins or the serpent's head, which was a type of sin, its head would be crushed, so that's a fatal blow. Um, and the woman's seed being Jesus, uh, heel would be bruised, uh, which is you know, a few days, three days, a uh, temporary wound. And so this is the, the first hope of salvation that we have, where God is saying, yes, I know you're dying now and you're going to suffer the consequences of that, but there is hope. There is something coming that will conquer sin. And so here, looking at our timeline, so uh, the timeline we established at the very beginning looks at 6,000 years of history to where we are today. So we believe, looking at um, genealogies in the Bible and using a lot of other metrics, um, we can accurately say, yeah, the start of uh, the Garden of Eden or starting of creation was, was about 6,000 years ago, which aligns perfectly to uh, the creation where there was six days of work. And the seventh day God rested, we believe that there will be a thousand year kingdom reign, millennial reign in the future. And so when we zoom in on our timeline here, we can see um, at uh, 4000 BC um, at the start, and we have obviously God's mission statement. We've got the creation um, and the blood necessary for sin. That's in Hebrews 9 verses 22, which sets up that important principle that um, with bloodshed is required for the remission of sins. And that was really the start of the animal sacrifices that we saw in the Old Testament. And then we got the promise of hope, um, which is Jesus. So three lines once again. The red line is sin and death. Um, the blue line is Jesus and seed. I know that's quite hard to read. Um, and the gre green line is earth and kingdom. So this promises in Genesis 3.15 is talking about Jesus and that promised seed. Um, so Romans 6, verse 23, I'll just read that out because it, it, it puts it um, really well. So Romans 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see that um, duality there and uh, that promise of Jesus. So that was week one. Really quick summary, I know, but we are going to go through this uh, pretty quickly uh, this afternoon. On to week two, Abraham, the man who was promised the world. His name started as Abram. Before we get into Abram, uh, let's think back. So um, about uh, 1,600 years um, have elapsed, um, and the period before the flood is called the Antediluvian period. So it was lasted about 1,600 years. Pretty long period, right? And so the earth was populated, um, but people weren't following uh, God's laws, and there was a lot of actual sin and corruption in the world, and actually God made God sad that he created man um, on the earth. But there was a faithful Noah um, who stood out amongst them, and God obviously, we know the story, um, God told him to build an ark to save um, his family and save a remnant of the animals so they could repopulate the earth. The important bit there is God shut the door. Um, why is that important? Because um, we think we can do things ourselves, but um, God's setting a principle here to be saved, and we see this in the sac sacrifice of Jesus, it's only through God's power that we can uh, uh, find salvation. 
And there's an echo here that we'll pick up as well in regards to how the waters washed away the old world and they started their new life. And that's obviously a type of baptism, which we'll, we'll cover off shortly. Um, but yeah, pretty, pretty incredible world event. And you can dig down anywhere in the world today and find um, that clay layer um, that they can find it all over the world. So it was a worldwide flood. Um, yeah, ended up in Mount Ararat. That's where they landed. And uh, God made a promise that he wouldn't flood the earth and wipe it clean again with a flood. Um, and the rainbow was set up as a promise um, to remind us of that, that great promise that he's made. So the people are starting to populate again. God said to spread out and populate the earth, um, but they, they congregated. Um, obviously, the flood was very fresh in their minds, so they wanted to build a tower. Um, and this was against God's uh, wishes, and so God actually confused their languages. So kind of forced them to, to spread out after that. So once again, straight away, man's doing things that are uh, opposite to what God was really asking them to do. So that was the Tower of Babel. So we see here in the timeline, so we've jumped forward uh, to 2,348 BC, roughly, um, and God made that promise, and then we got the Tower of Babel just before the transition of the millennial uh, to 2000 BC. So um, here's a rough estimation of where the, the major family groups from the three sons of Noah went. So Japheth is thought to be obviously the European nation, um, Shem, obviously the Hebrew and Arabian, or um, yeah, uh, Arab nations, and Ham, the African nations down there in northern uh, Africa. So yeah, we get introduced to Abram, which is the, the main uh, theme of uh, week two. So Abram was a very faithful man. He's um, known for his faith uh, all throughout the Bible. He started off in Ur, and God said, um, take your family to land of Canaan. Now, Abram didn't know anything about land of Canaan. It was a completely foreign land to him. Um, and they found Ur and found it to be the most advanced civilization of its day. They had air-conditioned ducting and everything. So God's asking him to go from a very comfortable place to somewhere um, that is completely unknown uh, and potential hostile. Um, but Abram's faith, um, he got up and he went with his family. Uh, because of Abram's faith, God made uh, a few really key promises. So Genesis 3.15 was the first major promise in the Old Testament. Um, the promises made to Abram were uh, the second major promises, and then there was third major promises made to David, which we'll cover off shortly. So God gave Abraham a four-part promise, so he's going to make him a great nation. So Abram just had his family union at this point, so to, to think that he's going to be an entire nation probably was pretty hard to wrap his head around. Um, make his name great in the earth, so everyone knows um, Abram or Abraham, um, both the Jews and the Muslim uh, nations um, track their ancestry back to Abraham. Um, bless those who bless him. And we have seen that played out in some history, but we don't really see that today. So that's something that um, potentially will continue to be uh, fulfilled in prophecy. Um, and bless all nations through Abraham. That's a really interesting one. Uh, bless all nations through Abraham. I wonder how all the nations in the entire world would be blessed through Abraham. We're going to put a, a lid in that bottle and we're going to come back to that in a few seconds, but just have a think about how that might happen. So the second promises, so these were in um, Genesis 12, further promises made in Genesis 13. So he's standing in the land of Canaan, which is Monday Israel. He says, look northward, southward, eastward, westward, everything you see I'll give to thee and thy seed forever. He didn't say look up. There was no promise of heaven as being the... The, um, the reward. It was physical land, modern-day Israel, um, made to Abraham and his offspring, um, and it was unfulfilled in Abraham's lifetime. Um, further promises were made, or prophecy was made in Genesis chapter 15, it says that his seed would go into a stranger's foreign land for 400 years. They would actually be in bondage, and they would serve others for that period, but they would en end up being delivered out of that. Um, and they were given the actual land that they would inherit. And so when we start to read the story about Moses and they talk about the promised land, this is what that's talking about, um, that land identified there. And this is the same land that will, they will inherit in the future kingdom as well, um, which we'll cover off in a later session. So when will the promises be fulfilled? Well, resurrection has to happen because Abraham and his descendants are dead and buried. We know that. Uh, it says it a couple of times in Hebrews chapter 11. 
So resurrection must occur. So this is the first um, time we pick up this idea of, of a resurrection, which becomes a stronger and stronger theme, especially as we get into the New Testament. It is a basic fund a Bible fundamental teaching. Um, and there's some great references in, in Daniel 12, verse 2, or 1 Thessalonians 4, um, verse 16 is also great. Um, that one says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So the New Testament leaves zero doubt in our mind around that resurrection is required. Now, going back to how all the earth, all, all the nations will be blessed through Abraham's seed, how is this going to happen? Well, we actually get the answer, which is really handy. In Galatians 3, verse 16, it says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. Right, okay. So that's how all the nations of the earth will be blessed. It's through um, the sac sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So confirms promises were made to Abraham's seed, not a single seed, sorry, is to a single seed, identifies that seed as Christ and uh, to be fulfilled through him. And how does this relate to us? So we're, we're in our, the Old Testament, but you know, we're starting to pick up this theme of, of a hope of salvation. How does this actually re relate to us? Well, once again, the Bible gives us the answer to this in Galatians 3, 27 to 29. Um, it says, for those that are in Christ have been baptized into Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither man nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus, and heirs according to the promise. So what's that telling us? So we put on Christ, we be become Christians by baptism. There's no discrimination, doesn't matter male or female, what nationality you are, for those baptized under Christ. If baptized, become adopted descendants of Abraham. So we um, get in, become inheritors of that, those, those promises. Once again, physical land, uh, something to look forward to. Uh, become heirs to promises made to Abraham. As heirs in line to inherit land promised to Abraham as an everlasting inheritance. So yeah, Galatians 3, 27 to 29, really important. And that's why we've actually put it on the timeline. So we've got the second great promises there in Genesis 12 and Genesis 13 relating to both Jesus the seed um, and that's all nations of the earth be blessed but the physical tangible land. So we've got our first green arrow going down to the earth kingdom um, as something to look forward to. So that, that was week two. Week three, Moses and the law given to Israel. So after Abraham, he had a son, Isaac. Now, we're not going to go into these stories, but they're just fantastically rich uh, stories that we can learn so much from, but we will be skimming them today. So he had Isaac. Um, Isaac um, had Esau and Jacob. Um, Jacob had his name changed to Israel, um, and that's why uh, the uh, Jews are known as the children of Israel. And so he had a number of sons and daughters, um, and I've just put numbers up there to track um, the actual tribes of Israel, uh, because it gets a bit confusing because there's more than 12 up there. So who are the actual 12 tribes? Um, so obviously going down the bottom, so uh, Joseph's mum was Rachel. Um, Joseph was, um, it's important just to really cover Joseph's story really quickly because it kind of links to the next section. So um, Joseph uh, was the youngest uh, child at the time before Benjamin was born and in, his brothers didn't like him. And so they actually sold him into slavery. He went into Egyptian slavery uh, for quite a number of years and was imprisoned, uh, being falsely accused. But God set that up intentionally um, where Joseph was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream and actually established himself to be second ruler in the land. And that's really in, important because when the drought happens, um, Jacob or jo is Israel sends uh, some of his sons down to get grain. And that's where they actually start to get established down into Egypt. So after that, they all move down into the land of Egypt which sets ourselves up for the next period. So remember the prophecy that was made, um, was it Genesis 15, where um, God told um, Abram that his descendants would be in bondage or slavery for 400 years. Well, that's when this happens. So all the um, uh, Israel and his entire family come down to Egypt. They occupy the land of Goshen, one of the best places in, in Egypt. Um, but they go and the, the Pharaoh changes. So the previous Pharaoh that liked Joseph and his family, dies and a new pharaoh comes on the scene. Um, and so there's so many uh, children of Israel at this time, the population just explodes. And so the new pharaoh puts them into bondage. 
And so that's where we pick up the story um, of um, basically Moses comes on the scene. So the people are in bondage, they cry it to God, this is 400 years into it, um, and they ask for deliverance. Um, they said, God, please help us. And so uh, God um, sets up Moses. So Moses' life is a, a three 40-year periods, so 40 years um, in the Pharaoh's court, 40 years in the wilderness, learning humility uh, and shepherding, and 40 years delivering the children of Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness. So if you remember Moses' life like that. And so basically Moses comes back, tells Pharaoh, set his people free. Moses says no, sorry, back. Moses comes back, asks Pharaoh, tells Pharaoh to set um, God's people free. Pharaoh doesn't want to, very stiff-necked. Um, and so God teaches him a lesson using the 10 plagues. The very last plague uh, was the worst of all in regards to the death of the firstborn. And so the way God saves um, his people um, to protect them from the Passover angel um, is to um, uh, have the what's called the um, Passover sacrifice. So a lamb was selected, and once again, there's this echo of the thread of the, the golden thread of Jesus Christ. So a perfect lamb was a selected one year old, and they had to use the blood, and they had to paint the lintels and the posts of the door, and they physically had to walk through that to be saved from the Passover angel. And once again, when we look at Jesus and, and baptism, we literally have to uh, be clothed or be covered through Jesus' sacrifice to be saved. So once again, it's this this um, foreshadowing or a prophecy about um, what Jesus would achieve in his death and resurrection. Um, and so after this, Pharaoh says, right, go, get lost. I don't want you in my land. And, and out they go um, into the, the wilderness. So they've just left Egypt and they come across uh, an impassable bit of sea. Um, and obviously we know the story where um, Moses held up his rod and God uh, caused a great wind. The waters parted and they, they went through the waters. They had the cloud that was guiding them overhead. And when we look to 1 Corinthians uh, 10 verse 1, it says, For I do not want you to be unawares, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptised unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So once again, the strong symbology, just like uh, Noah that we, we talked about, Noah's flood, where there was water underneath them and over them and washed away the past world and the past sin and they went into their new life, this was exactly the same, where they put the previous life of the Egyptian idolatry behind them and they stepped into their new life, walking towards the promised land. Um, yes, they went through 40 years of wilderness wanderings and we can liken that to our own, our own life now as we walk towards that future kingdom age. So once again, there's just so many golden threads and echoes of salvation and uh, God's love uh, made possible through Jesus. Really incredible. So they got through the Red Sea. Um, the Egyptian army was destroyed in that. God caused the waters to collapse. They go to Mount Sinai. They're there for about a year and they receive the Ten Commandments and Moses' law. And they confirm to God that, yes, we will obey you. God says, if you obey me, you'll have a fruitful life, you'll have a peaceful life, a rewarding life. But if you don't obey me, you'll suffer the consequences. And so uh, Moses' law was established. The Ten Commandments are basically a, a pretty good summary of what Moses' law contained. So four of the Ten Commandments were relating to God, one to parent, and the remaining uh, re relating to fellow man. Um, what's amazing is Jesus just puts it so, so beautifully um, when asked to what is the greatest law, Jesus. Um, Jesus' response said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commands, commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Isn't that just put so beautifully? If we love God, we're going to obey all, all, everything that we need to. If we love our fellow man, we're going to be doing all the aspects of the, the law uh, by virtue of our love for our fellow man. So pretty, pretty awesome how Jesus just summarised, you know, chapters and chapters of, of the law um, into two simple commandments. So looking at a timeline again, um, we've got Joseph in Egypt that caused um, um, Israel's family to come down um, after 400 years um, after the slavery. Um, Moses came to deliver them and they um, left Egypt and went into the wilderness wandering. They were given the law. So they've got the law. God also tells them to build this structure, um, which was a mobile structure um, called the tabernacle. Once again, there's some really 
rich learnings here for us in regards to sim symbology, but we don't, won't go into it. Um, and this really is what the temple uh, was built on in later years under Solomon. Um, and you've got the uh, obviously holy place and most holy place, which really um, is important um, when Jesus is crucified and what happens to that raiment and how Jesus fulfills that role as the high priest in the future. So what was the purpose of the law? Um, set up as a, um, to set them apart as a divine people. So the Bible tells us that the Jews are, are God's chosen people and are God's witnesses. It was also direct them to the Redeemer. In Galatians 3 verse 24, so the law was our custodian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. So remember at the very start how bloodshed was um, implemented as a result of our sin, and so animal sacrifice started. That was only a custodian to get us through to the ultimate sacrifice, which is Jesus Christ. So at the end of Moses' life, um, he, um, he failed to follow a commandment, and so you know, he wasn't overtly punished, but he didn't make it to the promised land. Um, but we're told in Hebrews that he is one of the faithful, so uh, we're confident he'll be raised to life again. And so this brings us to the um, entry to the promised land, which now Moses is off the scene. Um, jo um, uh, Joshua comes onto the scene as the God's elect leader of the people. And so they, God tells them to go into the promised land and, and conquer it, um, remove all the uh, evil nations. And there was some very evil nations in there. And this is some of his campaigns. Did he do it thoroughly to the letter or him and the people? No, um, they left a remnant of... Uh, these civilizations there, and that later came back and, and, and hurt them um, when they were um, got attacked by these other nations because they didn't thoroughly uh, get rid of them. And they got influenced by them as well, so some of the uh, idolatry crept into um, the Jewish customs. So that's the end of the, the third session. Um, it brings us to the period of the judges and the kings of Israel. So setting the scene, so they're in the land, they're freshly in there, but they have, no, they have no king besides God. So God is the, the king of Israel at this, at this point, but they've got no physical king. So this period, um, I, I believe it's from Acts 450 years, is the time of the judges. Um, so what happened? Basically, the four S's. So even though they promised at Mount Sinai they would follow God, they sinned, just like we all do. They suffered as a result of that sin by God used other nations to um, attack and, and punish them. They then sought God uh, because they were under persecution and then God sent um, salvation, which was the judges. So the judge would come on the scene that would resolve the situation, save the people, get them back on track, serving God. And then once that judge was off the, the scene, again, back to sin, suffering, seeking salvation. The last great judge was Samuel. Um, uh, so in uh, Hebrews 11, uh, what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Samuel who through faith administered justice and gained what was promised. So at the end of, near the end of Sam, Samuel's life, uh, the people came to Samuel and said, we want a, an earthly king. We want someone to lead us into battle. Samuel was really upset because up to this point, he was kind of their leader with God as, as the king. Um, and he spoke to God and God said, it's okay, Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've actually rejected me. And God gave them their wish, gave them uh, a, an earthly king. So the period of the judges sit there in our timeline, and some of the major judge, judges there, uh, Gideon, Samson, and, and um, Samuel. So Saul was the judge that God gave the people. Started off good, um, but had a weak nature um, and a uh, bit of lack of faith. And so God actually rejected him towards the end of his life um, and set up David as the next king um, over the 12 tribes of Israel. After David, Solomon came on the scene uh, between 971 and 931 BC, which we'll look at our timeline shortly. And after Solomon, we know the kingdom was divided um, into the northern tribes called Israel and the two southern tribes called Judah. So really quickly, we'll just cover off David and Solomon. So David was a man after God's own heart. He started off very humbly as a shepherd, um, and that gave him really the skills um, to, to lead God's people. Uh, he's known as a warrior king. He defeated Goliath and a number of and, and other major battles. Um, but he was human and he was failed. Uh, and, and he did fail. And we can learn a lot from David's life in regards to when we, when we sin and when we fail and how to respond to that. Um, God gave uh, the third major promise to, to David. And this is where it sort of ties up the previous two quite well. 
So in 2 Samuel 7, verse 11 to 16, um, God said that the seed would be provided after his death, and it's a dual uh, prophecy there, direct prophecy with Solomon, but a future prophecy in regards to Jesus. Um, seed to be set up a house of prayer, so a temple was built both in Solomon, but Jesus will build the, the future house of prayer in Jerusalem. God would establish seed as king over David's throne forever. So this is where we start to del- break away from Solomon fulfilling part of this to actually um, Jesus Christ being the, the promised seed. Uh, God would be the seed's father. He would not reject him as he did Saul. Um, a kingdom to be established forever. David would be alive when this promise was fulfilled and that's just um, by natural consequence. He would have to be alive to actually fulfill these promises. So the seed's identified. So once again, the Bible tells us the answer. Who is this promised seed? We're not, not left in any doubt. Uh, Luke chapter 1, 31, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord of God shall give him unto the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So once again, in our timeline, so King Saul just before the turn of the millennium, um, and then uh, King David after that. And the third great promise of um, the obviously the earth and the kingdom that would be last forever um, and also the seed being Jesus. So our third great promise made in the Old Testament. Solomon, um, once again, started really well. Uh, God said, what do you want? I'll, you know, I can provide um, whatever you wish. And Solomon asked for wisdom. God gave him everything else. Um, had a very peaceful life, a life um, of um, a great prosperity in the land of Israel. Um, but he eventually he did what God told him not to do had too many wives, put, um, had too many chariots and horses, and all that led him astray um, and uh, turned him to other gods. So as a consequence to this, God said, I'm going to divide up your kingdom. It's not going to happen in your lifetime, but it'll ha- um, out of respect for your father, David, but it's going to happen to your children in your children's timeline. And this is what happened. Uh, a, the, the kingdom was divided after Solomon. So Jeroboam was stood up. Um, to take on the ten northern tribes, and Rehoboam, which was the son of Solomon, uh, took looked after Judah. Um, So all of Israel had all wicked kings, not one good king, um, but there was a mix of good kings in Judah, in the tribe of Judah. Um, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin, is a classic sort of phrase we find in the Old Testament. That sin is actually setting up idolatry um, worship in the northern um, tribes. So because there was no good uh, kings in Israel, they didn't last very long, um, and they were actually taken into captivity by uh, the Assyria. So a pretty nasty nation, uh, very vicious, and it sent shockwaves throughout all the then known world. And eventually the Israelite kingdom fell in 722 BC. That only lasted 210 years. So in our timeline, we've got here um, the kingdom being split, uh, Judah and Israel, um, are both a mix of good and bad kings for Judah, and the Assyrian captivity in 721. Whew, okay. That was a lot, wasn't it? How are we going? Too much detail? Not enough? All right, cool. Well, we'll just break for five minutes. Um, I, need a, I need a drink. Um, go get a coffee, um, and then we'll kick off, and we'll um, finish off the last four sessions. <laughs> I won't wrap the next session, no. I, I will try and slow down a little bit. I know I'm going very fast, but there's just so much to cover. Um, and it is so exciting. So we'll, we'll keep going. All right, so week five, we covered off captivity in Babylon and return to Jerusalem. So we will get through these, um, these weeks a bit quicker. Um, so the kingdom of Judah, so just remember, um, the kingdom of Israel, um, it didn't last very long. The kingdom of Judah went for a bit longer because it did have some good kings. The good kings, you know, got rid of the high places, tore down the idols, and got people back on track to serving God. Um, and some of the good and bad kings listed there. Um, Finally, after a succession of evil kings, Judah suffered the same fate as Israel, um, survived 130 years longer um, because of the good kings. So now the Assyrian uh, nation was taken over by the Babylonian um, nation, led by King Nebuchadnezzar, um, invaded, and the nation taken into captivity um, into Babylon. Now there was a prophecy about this in Jeremiah 25, verses 11 to 12, and it says that they would be taken into captivity for 70 years, and we see that played out. So Ezekiel um, 21, verse 27, 
says, a ruin, a ruin, I will make it a ruin. It will not be restored until he comes to whom it rightfully belongs. To him I will give it. So this is basically the end of the kingdom of God on earth. Um, and uh, you've got three ruins there. So, you know, you could potentially line those up to um, three uh, destructions of, of Jerusalem, both then and um, both in the past and potentially in the future. Uh, but uh, basically it's saying that when Jesus returns, God will give the kingdom of Israel uh, back to him, which we've already looked at in Luke and the promises made to David in 2 Sam. So in our timeline here, so roughly nine, uh, five, 586 uh, BC, uh, Babylon uh, took the um, remaining tribe of Judah into captivity for 70 years. So the tribe, the kingdom of Judah or Israel uh, in captivity um, in Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. So this is the time where Daniel, uh, so we read uh, lots of things about uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel interpreted this dream of Nebuchadnezzar. He had this dream of a, of a big statue and this is an amazing prophecy, um, we're not going to go into detail, amazing prophecy to sink your teeth into. If you want to just pick at one prophecy, if you're interested in Bible prophecy, pick at this one. So it's just so fantastic how it perfectly aligns um, about what nation was going to proceed which nation, uh, because in Daniel it gives vivid uh, descriptions, both imagery and, and text, about what those nations would represent and what would happen. So pretty amazing prophecy um, that we still see uh, played out today uh, with the uh, Roman influence in the EU. Um, it, it does, in that prophecy, said there will be a stone that would destroy. So the, the statue was basically all these nations and the, each different metal um, was a, a different nation um, that would come after each other. Uh, but at the end of, of the prophecy, this, this stone cut without hands destroyed um, that, that um, image or, and uh, it uh, ground it to powder and grew into a mountain that covered the whole earth. And so we know that to be the future kingdom. And Jesus described in many locations as the stone um, that the builders rejected. So we're now looking at the um, period uh, between, uh, we're coming to the end of the Old Testament. So um, after the cap seven years of captivity, they went back to Jerusalem, they rebuilt the temple. It was never the same. Um, it uh, never returned to its former glory from Solomon. And then there was 400 years of silence. So from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there was no prophecies, no new word uh, from God. And in this time, when we look at our history books, um, we know that Alexander the Great um, led the Grecian army, and he's, he's described as a leopard because he, he took over the, the known world so quickly. And he was the, um, the medal of uh, brass or bronze in the uh, statue. And then we had the Roman Empire, which was the two legs of iron, being Rome and Con Constantinople. So Rome, as strong as iron. Um, and then time of Jesus um, was just before Jesus, Herod was on the scene, um, as we lead into um, the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1. So week six was Jesus Christ. So God's plan, when we look back at it, um, to fill the earth with his honour, glory, through a tried and tested population, to destroy sin through one man, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is saviour and Christ anointed, and so Christ Jesus anointed saviour. So when we look at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, and the angel said to her, this is to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So it's really clear here that he is the son of God, um, son of man is the promised seed all the way back from Genesis 3.15. Promises to Eve, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and David. At virgin birth prophesied in Isaiah 7.14. And so just focusing on the son of man, sorry, son of God, John 3, 16, the, the well-known verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that, he, but that the world through him might be saved. So once again, we get this idea of this loving father, you know, actively working to have a relationship with us and that he gave his only son that we have the hope that we have. It's pretty incredible stuff. And it's interesting to note that it's the Son of God, not God the Son. So um, Jesus and God being separate entities. Um, when we look at Son of Man as the uh, promise, so 
he was absolutely the son of man, born of a woman in Hebrews 2.14, um, fulfilled prophecy, um, performed miracles, um, and was, had human nature, um, had sinful nature. And um, Hebrews 9.26 uh, tells us that as well. Uh, if you want to read a bit more about uh, resurrection and what Jesus um, achieved through his own death, burial and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 is a great chapter to use. Um, why did Jesus have to die? It's often uh, a question that we ask. So when we go back to Adam and Eve, um, all the way back to them, we sinned. So we stepped away from God. And this is God's way of allowing us to be reconnected to him. And that started in Genesis 3.15. Because the wages of sin, i.e. the consequence of sin is death. It's inseparable. Um, at the very beginning, remember, we looked at how they tried to cover themselves in leaves. That wasn't good enough. Animal skins were provided, the start of bloodshed. Blood shed. Animal sacrifices throughout the Holy Old Testament leading towards that perfect sacrifice, which was Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus was of mortal sinful nature, so he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. That's what the Bible tells us. And so he overcame sin nature and destroyed a, a, a fatal blow to the head of sin in his own body, paving the way for us. Once for all sacrifice, opened the way of life to us. And 1 Corinthians 15, once again, it's a great chapter, it calls Jesus the first fruits. What does that mean? He was the first to be raised from the dead and have eternal life. And that means that there's fruit to follow and God willing that will be us and those that have fallen asleep in Christ. What's our response to this amazing opportunity? We need to recognise Jesus died for us in Galatians 2.20. Repent and be baptised, so reflecting on the sin nature in ourselves, repenting for that and committing ourselves to the waters of baptism. It's a physical act that means so much. Be committed to a Christian life. In Romans 6, verses 3 to 5, there's some great verses um, that we, we won't read, but um, please read those in your own time. So when we look at our timeline, um, once again, so Jesus was roughly 30 when he started his ministry. Um, at the age of roughly 33, um, he was uh, crucified and raised from the dead. Jesus overcame sin in Hebrews 2, 14. So that was that crushing blow to sin in, in his own body paving the way for the future blow to death in the future kingdom. Um, and Mark 16:16 16, 16 says repentance and baptism is absolutely needed. Um, makes no, um, yeah, we're left in little doubt about that fact. So that's Jesus Christ really quickly. Um, such a, a key week. We could have gone into so much more detail, but um, it is a, a quick summary. It's amazing what Jesus achieved through his sacrifice um, and resurrection. We now quickly look at the um, early church. So what happened after Jesus' resurrection? Um, he spent 40 days on earth working with his now apostles, getting them ready to go out to the whole world and preach, preach the gospel. Um, after he um, ascended uh, into heaven, um, he, it was promised that he was going to return. So um, in Acts 1 verses 9 to 11, um, basically his, some of his apostles saw him go up and they were just looking up seeing their master leave, and the angel said, don't worry, he's going to come back in the same way he left. And so we have that promise that Jesus Christ will return. It's called his second coming. So what do the apostles do now? They've had Jesus to lead them this whole way. They've been students of Jesus. What, how on earth do they preach the gospel to the, to the whole world? A massive charge that Jesus has left them. They don't have the Bible yet, remember? They don't have the New Testament. It's not complete. So God gives them the Holy Spirit um, to use, to spread the gospel. Um, and it happened at the Pentecost in Acts 2. What was it used for? It was for the writing of the scripture, because it says through inspiration the scriptures were written, uh, the testing of writings, the establishment of the believers and sound doctrine and practices, and opposing error. So these are some of the spirit gifts in the first century, um, lots of different uh, types of, of spirit gifts. And in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 10, it, it talk, in 1 Corinthians 13, it's talking about all the Holy Spirit gifts, and then it goes on to say, in context, then, um, you know, that which is in part will be done away with when that which is complete. Um, so basically what that is uh, actually talking about is that which is complete is actually the Holy Word, the Bible. So around this time, the, the New Testament was complete and the entire Bible was put together, so they didn't need the Holy Spirit gifts anymore. Um, they had the complete scriptures because the Holy Spirit gifts was just to help them spread the gospel. So the, what did the 
uh, apostles preach um, the gospel. What's the gospel? It's the good news about the kingdom of God and Lord Jesus Christ in Acts 28 verses 30 to 31. It offers salvation. Romans 1 verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for anyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So it, the gospel and the hope of Jesus just spread through like wildfire throughout um, Asia, uh, Asia Minor here. So by AD 48, it had spread to Athens, and by AD 60, it spread all the way to Rome. So absolutely wildfire. Um, so new believers were baptised by immersion in water. So you might have heard of John the Baptist. He really prepared the people for the symbol of baptism. And then once Jesus uh, was crucified, rose from the dead and was um, ascended into heaven, people were baptised into Jesus as a, also, uh, as a sin covering. So it's full immersion in water. It's not sprinkling. There's nowhere in the Bible that, says, that gives an example of sprinkling of water. It's full immersion. And that's you know, the type of Noah's Ark that's crossing the Red Sea. It's washing away. And Romans 6 tells us that we're buried with Jesus when we go um, into the waters um, and we rise uh, a new man or a new woman um, out of there and we walk anew. Um, so identified with Christ, sacrificed by symbolic death, like I said, rose from the water to begin a new life. So a lot of um, acts and um, uh, sort of articulate the uh, travels of the apostles. So we're introduced to this um, character named, started off with the name Saul, and he got his name changed to Paul. He wrote the majority of the New Testament, as you can see in the green books there. Um, a, lot, a lot of people believe he also wrote um, Hebrews um, when you look at the, um, the New Testament. Um, yeah, he, he started off um, being on the wrong track, but Jesus intervened and put him back on the right track, and he became one of the, the uh, biggest um, spreaders of the gospel. Um, when we look at the church organisations and some of the challenges they had, so there was no big church buildings. It's not about the building. Uh, God's church is uh, actually, in Greek, is ecclesia, and it's the body of people. It's got nothing to do with physical walls or a roof. So they, they met in people's homes, they met wherever they could. There's no paid ministers, you know, there's no um, principles in the Bible of uh, having a paid ministry. Um, Paul himself was a tent maker, travelled around, he had to earn his own money to, to pay for his own food. Yes, they were supported by the clergy here and there, but um, yeah, there's no idea of these paid ministers or pastors or priests. It was a lay community um, and they called the community ecclesia or congregation. Um, there was all these challenges because all these Jews and Hebrews were being converted over to Christianity, so they bring a lot of these old laws with them and that was causing all sorts of issues. Um, and a lot of the letters uh, de in the New Testament detail um, those challenges. Um, other problems arose concerning nature of Jesus and the inspiration of apostles. So once again, you'll find in a lot of the letters Paul was writing, he was writing to try and correct the, these errors um, that were coming up in the, these new ecclesias. So looking at our timeline, um, we've got the Pentecost, they've got the Holy Spirit, gifts now, um, Paul's converted and he does a huge amount of amazing work Paul's journeys, he has three major journeys, spreading the gospel all the way out, out near Rome. Um, and uh, what did they teach? Repentance and baptism. In AD 70, Jerusalem was actually destroyed uh, by Rome. Um, they re rebelled. It was prophesied. Um, a prophecy was given to them about when there was a reprieve to get out, and that reprieve was given. Uh, but Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans, and they were dispersed. Um, when the Jews killed Jesus on the cross, they said, you know, let his blood be on our children, our children's children. And that certainly played out for about 2,000 years, um, as we see in our, in our modern history as well. Um, and roughly AD 90, uh, the New Testament is finished and the compilation of the whole Bible is put together um, from the Old Testament as well. So that brings us to our last week, week eight, the kingdom of God, which Craig just covered off last week for us. So what are we to expect um, in, in today? Well, the Bible tells us that things will happen in this order. Jesus will return, just like Acts 1 verses 11 says, he, he's going to return in like manner, as you saw him go up into heaven, he will return. Uh, the Bible leaves little doubt, zero doubt, that when he returns, he's going to rise uh, from the dead those that are asleep or have died. Um, there will be a judgment uh, for those uh, that believe in Christ. After the judgment, uh, those that are found worthy will be given immortal life. Those that are found not worthy um, will, will pass away again. And so they'll be called uh, saints. They'll become saints in this future kingdom. 
there'll be an Armageddon, um, there'll be a big fight uh, around Israel and Jerusalem, and after that, Jesus will be over all the, all the world. And it'll be a new world order for a thousand years. So let's look at those major events in just a bit more detail. Um, Jesus' return in Acts 1, verse 7 there, um, and Acts 3, verse 20 and 21. God shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. So we're left in little doubt that he's coming back. There's actually over 200 references to Jesus' return. Um, for those playing along at home, if you wanted to just turn up one of those, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 15 to 16 is a great one to turn up. When we look at resurrection, um, Jesus was the first person raised, never to die again. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 23 says, For since by man came death, so Adam, by man also came the resurrection of the dead, Jesus. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all should be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, so there's that term again, first fruits, afterwards those who Christ, who are Christ at his coming. So baptism is the key to resurrection. The Bible clearly tells us you need a belief, you need to be baptised, and you, that equals the hope that we have in resurrection. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptised shall be saved, but he does not believe will be condemned. Once again, an infant doesn't believe in anything besides the comfort of his mum. Um, you need a belief, and you then need the action of baptism to be saved. John 3, 13 says, no one has a, sorry, sorry, our reward is on earth, not heaven. So remember I talked about the promises made to Abraham? Didn't say look up. It was physical, tangible uh, land that they were promised. Um, and in John 3, 13, it says, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And if anyone was going to get into heaven, surely it's a man after God's own heart, which is David. But Acts 2, 34 says, for David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself, the but says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus, sorry, David is dead and buried and he's waiting the return of Jesus to raise him from the dead. Once again, lots of different uh, Bible references to the resurrection. If you're playing along at home, turn up John 5, 28 to 29 if you wanted to turn up just one of them. Really good passages there. The judgment, what's that about? There will be a judgment when Christ returns. In Romans 14, verses 10 to 12, but why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, conditions do apply. So um, there are some Christians that believe that all you do need to do is believe in Jesus, accept Jesus into your life, and you're saved, no matter what. But the Bible actually says, no, there's a bit more to it than that. Um, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, and it goes on to list a number of things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So it's, it's pretty black and white, but it leaves the question, can we actually earn this? Can we just you know, focus on our works and we can assure our salvation? Well, actually, the Bible says it's a gift. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it is a gift given to us from God. So that's the judgment. Like I said, those that are found worthy will be made immortal and be saints. Those that are not found worthy will pass away. And then there will be those that rise up against Jesus Christ in the end. And movies have been made about Armageddon, but the Bible's version is quite a bit different to the, the movie Armageddon. And basically, there will be a battle for those opposing Jesus' reign. They'll actually call Jesus the Antichrist, is what the Bible tells us, um, which is crazy. This battle will ensue and obviously Jesus and the saints will be victorious in that battle and then the kingdom of God will be established. So Jesus will be king. He will be great and be called the son of the highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father. We've read this quite a number of times this afternoon. So Jesus will put down all opposition to God, will have dominion over the whole earth, um, all nations will serve him, will establish a new worldwide order, law. The world's population will go to Jerusalem once a year and his rule will be one of righteousness, justice, and peace. Not making this up, please read your Bible, and we can give you the Bible references um, to, to back the, all these up. So Isaiah 2, verse uh, 2 to 4, articulates um, Jerusalem as the future um, capital of this worldwide kingdom in Jerusalem. And that's just an artist's impression of Ezekiel's temple. 
So the kingdom of God will go for a thousand years. Um, We're told that in Revelation 20 verse 4, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So once again, it lines up perfectly with the seven days of creation. Six days of toil, we're at 6,000 years. We're looking forward to the next thousand years of rest, and that's going to be the time of the kingdom, a time of healing and peace. So looking at our timeline, our promise of resurrection, John 5, 28 to 29, return of Jesus sometime, um, anytime. When we look at um, events uh, subsequent to the return of Jesus, um, we're pretty confident he's just around the corner um, based on the um, things that are happening in the nations all around us. There'll be the resurrection in order, judgment, um, immortality um, will be given to those faithful. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52. Armageddon and then the thousand year reign. So really quickly, what does this kingdom look like? Um, The head of government, so Jesus will be obviously the king on David's throne and David will be raised to see that promise fulfilled. Seat of government will be um, in Jerusalem. Uh, Once again, that's what Jerusalem looks like today. The Dome of the Rock is there. Uh, That's what the picture on the right is what it looked like in the future. Once again, just an artist's interpretation uh, found from the prophecy of Ezekiel. Uh, We're told there'll be no more wars in the kingdom. Um, The photograph there of beating a sword into a plowshare um, is in the front of the UN building. That's what they're trying to achieve, uh, unsuccessfully, I might add. Um, But this will be achieved in the future kingdom age. There's so many scripture that talks about uh, what this kingdom age will look like. Um, All disease and suffering will be done away with. There will be healing, the blind, deaf, dumb and lame healed. People shall not be sick. Lifespan will be extended as well. The lamb will be healed. Um, God tells us that he will undo all the damage that man has done and heal the land. It says there will be living waters flowing out of Jerusalem that will heal all the deserts. Agriculture will be turned around. So the biggest problem facing the UN now is starvation. There is still today in 2024 people that are starving to death. That's just unacceptable. Jesus and God will solve that in the future kingdom age. The plowman shall overtake the reaper planting vineyards. There will be so much food, they'll be lapping each other. So in conclusion, in Revelation chapter 20, what happens at the end of this millennial reign? Really quickly, towards the end, um, the saints and, and the angels will step back uh, from governing the people um, and man will be given free reign Um, and obviously there's still a mortal population during this kingdom age and so sin nature will come come to a head um, and people will start to rebel again. There'll be a second resurrection and a second judgment um, and that'll be at the end of that second judgment that'll be the end of sin nature and uh, human um, uh, mortals on the earth. How do we know that? 1 Corinthians 24, 26 and 28. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son, Jesus, also himself, be subjected unto him, God, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So this is the ultimate fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Jesus achieved that in himself. At the end of the kingdom age, it'll be achieved for um, absolutely everybody. And like I said, God wants a relationship. He's a loving father. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus, sorry, God wants us in this future kingdom. That's found from Luke 12, verse 32. So there'll be a second judgment at the very end of that thousand year uh, millennial reign. And I've put an X there at the end of that red line. And that's the end of it. The blue and the green continue. We're not told what happens past that, but God has now um, taken over. Jesus has handed the kingdom back to God, and we're told it'll go forever, but we're not giving any details past then, uh, what happens past the thousand-year reign. And then, only then, will God's ultimate purpose be actually fulfilled, where all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, uh, fulfilling his mission statement. So, pretty exciting time to look forward to, isn't it? We've covered off a lot of history, a lot of um, scripture, probably feeling pretty overwhelmed and (laughs) overstimulated by my fast talking. Uh, Before we wrap up our nine-week seminar series, was there any questions, um, any clarifications? Did anything not make sense? Was there any linkages that weren't clear uh, that potentially we could just spend a few moments clarifying? No, awesome. Cool. Well, 
I'd like to thank you once again so much for your participation. It's been a great support for the nine-week seminar series. Um, you know, I think all the presenters really enjoy uh, presenting and giving it, and I can tell it's been um, yeah really well um, received. So we'll close up uh, today's presentation just with a word of prayer.